My name is Andy Sokolovich. I serve as the Vice President of Economic Development for the Clinton Regional Development Corporation. Welcome to the Clinton Region Business Roundtable. We host these every single month where we bring in subject matter experts to talk about things like today's legislative update, but we also cover workforce development, culture, and the list goes on and on. So look for a new event every single month. We hope to get back to doing these in person, but for now, they are virtual events. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Iowa Association of Business and Industry. I had the pleasure and the amazing opportunity to be a part of their Leadership Iowa program, which if you have not enrolled in Leadership Iowa or even investigated, I strongly encourage you to do so. I was part of the greatest class ever in 2015 and 16, where I got to travel all around the state of Iowa and learn about economic development healthcare, and just a tremendous amount of topics really that concern us as Iowans. So at the end of every legislative session, we like to tap into ABI and get an update as to what happened, what they expect moving forward, and then an opportunity for you to ask questions of their legislative team. So I'm going to go ahead and be quiet now, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nicole Crane, J.D. Davis, and Brad Hartkoff, who are the experts when it comes to legislative updates at ABI. So I don't know who's kicking it off first, but I'm assuming it's you, Nicole. It is. Great. Yeah, thank you, Andy. And we are huge fans of yours and the Clinton Regional uh, Development Corporation. Thank you so much for inviting us, and we're glad to be here virtually. Uh, I know that we've also taken some trips recently over to Clinton, so we'll look forward to uh, being over there. We have a great partnership and really appreciate uh, all of your efforts to grow the state and grow the region as well. So uh, Andy gave an introduction, so I won't spend more time. I'm going to talk a little bit about ABI just briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to the uh, gentleman on the Hill to talk about our policies this past year and, and what we were able to accomplish and what's ahead for uh, business in Iowa. So for those of you who may not be familiar, here's just a little bit about ABI. We were established in 1903 as the Iowa Manufacturers Association. We now represent all industries, but a lot of our members are still in manufacturing. We're the largest statewide business organization. We have 1,500 member companies and we're in all 99 counties. And you can see our mission there as well. And when you think about ABI, Brad, we can go ahead and go to um, the industry served. Like I mentioned, most of our membership is still in manufacturing and the financial services, which it's pretty representative of Iowa's economy as a whole. As you look at our GDP, those are the top two that keep coming up. So it would make sense that, you know, financial services, that's in, that includes insurance, banking, um, you name it, that's kind of in that, uh, that sector. And then manufacturing, as you all know in Clinton, is a very big part of what we do. Also have a lot of architectural construction and engineering. But when you think about ABI and you think about the size of the members, you know some of our large members, you know, um, ADM, Cargill, uh, but we also have a lot of Lion Del Basel, of course. We also have a lot of small, uh, smaller size companies, mid sized <coughs> companies. That's really um, who we represent at the Capitol because a lot of those larger companies have their in house uh, representatives, but we have a lot of smaller members as well. So you can see. 38% and 26%, so ever over 50% of our membership um, is represented by employers of 100 or fewer. And so, again, a lot of smaller companies that we do represent. And then you can see the goals of ABI, which are to advocate, educate, and motivate. And motivate is really where the Leadership Iowa program comes in with our foundation. We also have an Elevate Advanced Manufacturing. I know that several of you in the Clinton area are familiar with that program. It's to really encourage high school students and parents to about the cool careers that uh, you can have in Iowa in manufacturing specifically. And then I want to talk a little bit more about how regional businesses can partner with ABI. So whether you're a member or not a member of ABI, there's a lot of opportunities to get engaged in our organization and partner across the state. Andy mentioned Leadership Iowa. Uh, I mentioned Business Horizons, Leadership Iowa University. So nominate. Whether you're a member or not, ABI Foundation programs are open to member to companies and individuals all across the state. Uh, if you have a company that has high school, uh, your employees have high school students, nominate for them to participate in the Business Horizons pre program. It's a week-long uh, immersion program. It just concluded actually yesterday. And then Leadership Iowa University is for college age. And then again, the Leadership Iowa program. Communicate. Let us know what issues affect your business. Again, whether or not you're a member, we need to know the pulse of what's happening in the business community. We represent the businesses because you all are busy doing what you do every day. You don't have time to be the capital. That's why we have Brad and JD up there every day on your behalf. Participate. 
attend ABI events. A lot of our events are open to members and non-members. If you're a member, you get a discount. Um, but if you're a non-member, you're open to and welcome to attend. We'd love to see you there. And then partner, we have an IAVotes.com website. Local elections are coming up this year. It's not a big statewide election, but there are city uh, and county races that are very important and school board that are very important uh, to get engaged and to know uh, who the candidates are and, and making sure you're registered to vote. So use that IAVotes.com website to find out information and also to communicate with your legislators and your employees. And then, of course, join us. We have a lot of benefits if you want to become a member of ABI, everything from discounts on uh, manufacturing insurance uh, to supplies and also um, grants for uh, individuals who want to go back to school, whether that be at Upper Iowa University or Mount Mercy. So a lot of opportunities to get engaged. Feel free to reach out to us anytime. We are here for you. We serve the members and we serve businesses around the state. So don't hesitate to contact us at any time. I'm going to now turn it over to JD, who's going to dive into why you're all really here to talk about the 2021 legislative uh, session. JD. Hey, J JD, before you speak, I just wanted to tell everybody, you know, we have strong ties to ABI. Our own Rich Phelan, who serves as the interim president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, is the treasurer of ABI's board. And then my boss, President and CEO Aaron Cole, serves on their board as well. So we are deeply ingrained with ABI. I want to thank them for being here. Sorry about that, JD. Go ahead. No, that's fine. That's good to note, Andy. And, and I will also say, not only are they part of the organization, they're very active representatives and they do Clinton very well. They're, whenever we are gathered, they are there. So we really appreciate their help. Um, yeah, but, and as we've kind of foreshadowed, we're going to give a recap of what happened at the 2021 session this year. Uh, a lot of lot was accomplished. It's going to be kind of unrolling uh, uh, now as these programs that have been passed uh, this last year uh, uh, become reality. Uh, and I think, Andy, you've got a great sized group today. And so you, you mentioned getting into the chat too. I think as Brad and I walk through this, if anybody has a question, I don't think we'll be talking over the top of each other if we just go ahead and unmute and say, hey guys, stop, I need more on that issue. Or did this happen, what happened? We invite that, uh, that, that would be a great way to be interactive. Make sure you get the information that we probably have, but uh, if we're not thinking of delivering it the way that you need it, uh, let us know. Uh, and then, and that is also part of the second thing we're trying to do. We are just wrapping up a, a period of time when we've been going out throughout the state asking for input on the next stuff. You know, we, we know what we've got done in the legislature this year. Uh, how do we bootstrap that with the next ideas that we're working on? Uh, we want your input. This is a very valuable uh, meeting for us today for that purpose to, to hear what it is that uh, you're thinking of in, in your part of the state. So the, thank you, Brad. And Brad, to you. Well, thank you, JD. And again, I'd like to echo what Nicole and JD said. We're very appreciative to have the opportunity to uh, speak to the folks at the Clinton Regional Development Corporation. And thanks to Andy and Aaron for hosting us here today. And uh, hopefully you'll learn some great information that you can take back to your companies. And uh, we we'll look forward to having your input later on during the, the presentation. Before we dive into the policy process and get into our policies, I wanted to give everybody kind of a, a lay of the land with what JD and I were working with at the Capitol this past year. And as you can see, uh, Republicans <clears throat> control the legislature. They have fairly strong majorities right now. And this is the fifth year consecutive year that they've had the legislative trifecta, which means they control the House, the Senate, and then also the governor's office. And they'll have one more year of that going into 2022. And then there will be the elections to determine uh, what the makeup looks like following that. Our policy process here at ABI is uh, we it's magnified by being grassroots. Um, some organizations are very top down. Uh, we're the exact opposite. We come out to the members. Um, in fact, we've just had uh, four or five regional meetings over the course of the last six to eight weeks, and this is kind of a continuation of that. Uh, we like to get feedback from members and uh, we appreciate what they tell us what we should be advocating for at the Capitol. And so as I said, we had just had uh, regional meetings and uh, next month we have five public policy committee meetings that will take place and those begin on Monday, August 9th uh, when our environment committee will be meeting. Uh, you can learn more about those uh, events by going to iowaabi.org. We have registration available for ABI members and so please do check those out. Once those committees meet, they provide recommendations to our legislative committee who then uh, reviews them and then uh, establishes priorities for the association going into 2022. 
And then those recommendations go on to our board of directors who ultimately uh, provides their seal of approval on the policies and priorities for the coming year. So that's really how our, our process works and how we formulate what we're going to stand for at ABI. And then just a quick review of what our priorities were for this last year before we dive into uh, really the meat of it. Workforce um, is something that we've been focused on for the last uh, number of uh, legislative sessions at the Capitol. Uh, there are a number of subsections that fall underneath that, as you can see in that first bullet point, uh, child care, workforce housing, uh, workforce training programs, and workplace safety. So uh, we're going to be talking about this in depth. And uh, just to give you a bit of background, workforce hasn't always been a priority for the legislature at the Capitol, but that's really changed over the last uh, number of years. And that's because of uh, companies reaching out to their legislators and telling them how important it is that they focus on this and really advance policies that upskill our workforce and make jobs more available. So hats off to everybody for contacting their legislators about this issue. Uh, the infrastructure uh, priority, this is really focused on high speed broadband access uh, and JD is going to elaborate on this uh, in a little bit. Uh, there was really a lot of great success, a big policy bill this year as well as appropriations and the pandemic really changed how important broadband access is for all Iowans, both in urban and rural areas. So more to come on that in a little bit. And then regulatory reform. This is a, a, a per perennial priority for ABI. Uh, we're always looking to try to cut red tape for our member companies uh, to make uh, their companies operate more efficiently and profitably. And uh, it really provides an area of where members can tell us specific pieces of the law that they'd like us to focus on or the administrative code. Uh, if there's a regulation that needs to be reformed or repealed, we can focus on that as well. Well, thank you, Brad. And as you can imagine, if you put five committees together and some of these committees have 50 some members, uh, a lot of content, uh, a lot of experts uh, gathering and a lot gets pushed up to our board of directors. Uh, one of their jobs then is to uh, provide focus to the organization of just exactly what it is that we're going to go out and chase uh, uh, and help policymakers uh, develop uh, when we're in legislative session. Uh, and so drilling down a little bit, uh, we, we came up with three priority areas, uh, workforce and the focuses there were child care and workforce housing, unemployment tax reform and funding for the, for the programs, primarily at community colleges that help upskill our workforce and workplace safety. Uh, infrastructure, they were laser focused this year. Uh, they wanted to see advancements uh, and in the deployment of not just broadband, but high speed broadband in a way that could uh, kind of plant the future for the way manufacturing can use information technology. And then regulatory reform was a very busy period for us this year because of the pandemic and the reaction that we had to have as a staff to keep our, our uh, membership informed about changing guidelines and requirements from federal and state agencies on dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and that, that took most of our time in the regulatory reform area. Uh, moving on, the first thing we kind of highlighted in the workforce area was child care. And you're going to see a series of slides now, uh, and really they're ordered in the same way. Uh, the, the first, the first statement is uh, the statement that ABI came up with as how they support a specific initiative. And here we're talking about uh, solutions and incentives to help businesses overcome barriers to employment. Uh, and one of those highlighted was childcare. Uh, so very strong on that. Uh, the governor, uh, in her state, the condition of the state message also uh, took a strong position on child care, advocating that uh, the uh, child care tax credit uh, family income limit uh, was increased from $45,000 to $90,000 a year uh, to help families with affordability of child care. Uh, the next, uh, next thing that she got after was the availability of child care. And uh, that's uh, allocating $25 million of block grant money from the federal government to go out and find those places where childcare is just not available and, and work with the local uh, communities, local employers uh, and families on figuring out how to stand up childcare where it does not exist. Uh, leg the legislature then uh, took their own actions and we were very pleased with the outcomes, bipartisan support for childcare. Uh, we had uh, the fo legislature followed through and did the 
uh, the doubling of the uh, family income limit for uh, the affordability of child care. They also addressed uh, the cliff effect, which many employers are very familiar with this. Uh, that the, the child care tax credit is something that was provided with that income limit. And if you had somebody in your organization that was progressing along and you tried to offer them uh, a different job, more responsibility and more pay, many times we were having employees come back to us saying, oh, appreciate that. It sounds like a dream job, can't take it. Uh, I lose the, it actually sets me back uh, with the income uh, because of the effect of the child care tax credit being eliminated with the new income. The legislature addressed that this year, very happy they did that. It will phase out now so people can have kind of a natural arc to their progress through their work, work career. Uh, and then also uh, uh, the legislature did follow through uh, on a child care challenge fund, which is uh, money available for employers to come up with kind of pilot projects on how to solve uh, the child care issues. And I think on this page, the one thing that, the, that I would highlight is the, is the last bullet, and that is that uh, the legislature did act to require full-time, 100% in-person learning for students. Uh, we thought that was important just for the planning aspect of families and how they have to decide, is someone staying home because the kids may be home? Uh, can we go back to work? Uh, do we have to have a hybrid situation? Uh, we thought this provided good certainty uh, both in the education realm, but also uh, in, in the work world and in the family uh, time budgeting. So we appreciated that action as well. Shifting over to our next priority underneath workforce is uh, a workforce housing. And one thing I'd like to note is uh, as we go through some of these slides, you're going to notice a recurring theme. Uh, we start off with ABI's pol pol policy, excuse me, and then we talk about uh, what Governor Reynolds uh, recommended in her condition of the state address concerning the issue and then see how the legislature reacted to that. And I think all of us know that there's a shortage of available and affordable workforce housing across the state of Iowa it can act as a hindrance to uh, uh, trying to employ individuals who might like to take uh, jobs, uh, particularly in rural areas, but there just isn't the housing available for them to do that. So the legislature did a lot this year, as you can see in those four bullet points at the bottom. And I'll just highlight one key point that we think is a, a really big success is increasing that workforce housing tax credit program from 25 to 40 million for this current fiscal year that we're in now. And then that comes back down to 35 million moving forward. And we think that's gonna help clear out the urban backlog. Uh, there's a rural and then an urban side of this tax credit program. It's gonna get projects out there more quickly by ending that backlog. So we were really pleased to see that. And um, then the rule set aside in that tax credit program, it goes up to, I think, 17 and a half million beginning in FY23, which is the next fiscal year. Then another piece. Just, uh, just to give you some insight, yes. sir, we've been able to leverage uh, the workforce housing tax credit aggressively here in Clinton County. We've got two projects right now. Uh, one is on the horizon. It's going to be 55 market rate apartments, which really is going to act as a catalyst uh, to our downtown development. So I appreciate your support for that program, and I appreciate the governor's increased funding to support that program. No, Andy, that's really great to hear. Thanks for sharing that information. And it's really anecdotes like that that help us as lobbyists at the Capitol when we're talking to legislators about why this policy should change. Hearing those kinds of uh, success stories makes a big difference. So uh, thank you for sharing, Andy. Um, funding for workforce programs. Again, this has been a priority over the last number of years. Uh, Governor Reynolds really spearheaded Future at Iowa, uh, which was a, a, a all inclusive look at how we can upscale our workforce here in Iowa. And the goal is to ensure that uh, individual, I think 70% of Iowans having some kind of uh, credential attainment outside of a high school diploma by 2025. And uh, the legislature has done a lot to uh, uh, see that goal coming forward. Uh, as you can see, uh, the last dollar scholarship program, which is a, a key component of Future Ready Iowa, that was increased by $10 million for this fiscal year. And really what that program does is give that financial boost to those uh, students and individuals who need that last little bit of help to get that uh, high demand degree or credential so that they can fill jobs that are available out there in the state. Another key piece on the, the workforce program side is uh, the Future Ready Iowa funding. That's gone to $4.2 million for this fiscal year. 
and JD talked about how three million of that is going towards the child care challenge fund, which we are very supportive of because we know there's a lack of available and affordable child care across the state as well. So uh, great to see those programs funded. There's a lot of return on investment for the state when they put those dollars in there. So uh, we couldn't be more pleased that they decided to take that action this year. Hey, Brad, real quick, I did just put in the chat. We've had a couple questions, so I've been monitoring the Thank chat you. and adding some comments in there. I did just put also a link to the Iowa Women's Foundation. They have actually put together um, a business and child care toolkit. So if you're interested in trying to help support your employees or what you can do even as a small employer to find resources on the child care side, no cost to you, but uh, put a link in there. And then also um, we had some questions regarding CTE and AEA and funding. Um, for that type of learning. So we are hearing from the, I believe the superintendent talking about enrollment numbers from AEA 9 and then uh, what that looks like. So um, just wanted to let everyone know there's some information for you in the in the chat as well. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Brad, I'll go ahead and go on to uh, infrastructure now. And uh, we kind of said at the beginning, we were focused on one thing in infrastructure this year. Our policy, as you see at the top, is all about moving you know, people, products, and information uh, across the state and across the world uh, to keep us uh, you know, available to be in any market. Uh, and so we focused on broadband deployment in Iowa this year. Uh, Iowa has been a, a lagging state in, in the development and the deployment of broadband and, and broadband at, at speeds that uh, uh, can really help uh, businesses and, uh, and, and others uh, prosper. So we have strong advocates on that. The governor came out very strong. They made the decision that they were not going to play catch up. Uh, they wanted to lap the field. They wanted to have a program that had such presentation value that everybody would stand up and notice about what was going on in Iowa. Uh, and she rolled out a three-year $450 million program, $150 million a year that would focus on very high speed uh, internet deployment, uh, 100 megabits per second up and download speeds. Uh, and uh, the legislature uh, uh, caught that. Uh, we are, you know, it, because of the pandemic and because of uh, much of the, the stimulus plans and the money that have been set aside by Congress to, to keep us moving during uh, the pandemic, uh, the legislature was trying to figure out exactly what they could anticipate would be the federal play of, of dollars that could be allocated for this purpose and what the state should do uh, to make sure that we had a robust program that met the, the governor's goal of high presentation value uh, that would really make everybody stand up and notice what's going on in Iowa. And, uh, and again, bipartisan support for the broadband issues uh, and what the legislature decided in the end was $100 million uh, would go into this program. 80% of that would be set aside for those ultra high speed up and down low speeds. 20% of it would solve that problem of where areas where they just needed to catch up to deployment of broadband uh, so that they could then be positioned to, to leap into the speed game. Uh, we expect that uh, there'll be more clarity on what's available in federal funding and that that will be added into this hundred million. Uh, the, the, uh, we're learning more and more that the, the latitude for states to do that with money that's already been sent is available. We have to be a little careful that we don't allocate more in any one year than the construction season can absorb and actually get done. Uh, but uh, we, we are very, very confident uh, that this has changed the business models of companies in Iowa uh, that are in the, the, the provider game. Uh, we noticed that because uh, one of the best stories we can tell, uh, two, uh, uh, two companies in the ABI membership, uh, uh, one a provider, uh, uh, has, uh, has executed a contract with an excavator uh, manufacturer uh, in, the, in the state uh, to buy more machines to get more fiber in the ground, and and that is a uh, that is the the guarantee that you can have that uh, this program hit its mark, and that we're going to see you know rapid deployment here because at the end of the day, uh, most of these providers are multi-state providers, and they're going to go wherever their capital is treated the best, and I think what we've done here is we've put Iowa to the front of the line on who's going to get. Uh, next season's uh, uh, 
uh, you know, construction season of, of, of broadband deployment. We think this is a great success, bipartisan success of the legislature this year. We mention it in every meeting we go to. Yeah, J.D., just to give you some insight to what we're doing here in Clinton, uh, Clinton County is leveraging their ARP funds, uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds to do a countywide broadband study to identify where there are gaps. I think the key to success specifically for Clinton County is going to be the collaboration amongst utilities, mm -hmm. because as we're tearing up roads already to lay in infrastructure, it's important to collaborate with those local fiber um, companies to ensure they can lay the conduit to support their own expansion. We work with my Miles Communication and out of Miles, Iowa, who's been phenomenal and is actually working with the city of Clinton right now to develop a plan to connect all their municipal buildings and then serve as nodes to expand out and serve the residential areas of our community. So we support broadband. Yeah, it's wonderful. And and I think the other thing that uh, just has been quietly happening over the last few years is the Department of Transportation has really upped its game in the way that it can aid in coordinating you know, activities in the right of way. Uh, when you're getting in there and doing that. I know that uh, that has been a major focus of that department for a period of years. And it, and from what I understand from hearing from the utility partners is that that is improving. So, uh, so good for you guys. That sounds like you're ahead of the game and ahead of the curve. Now I'm going to move on to another uh, large component of what the uh, uh, the the work of the legislature, the governor and ABI was here this past year. And uh, uh, ABI, uh, has always had a position of, of lightening the tax burden so that uh, capital can be put into businesses and create wealth and employ people. And, and so uh, we were always encouraging, uh, you know, that move in tax policy. And, and the governor this year in her uh, condition of, this, of the state uh, proposed eliminating uh, a revenue and growth triggers that were put into a previous tax law. Uh, that 2018, they you know, made some changes that were contingent on uh, meeting certain goals in the collection of revenue or the growth of the state coffers over time, uh, which has the effect of being good fiscal policy for caretake of the treasury, but it has one downside, and that is that uh, individuals with capital to deploy uh, do not have a signal on how that capital is going to be treated by the, by the tax collector uh, to know what they have available to, to invest in any period of time uh, and you really miss out on uh, kind of a growth factor of, of, of the stimulus of, of businesses getting busy all at once uh, to lift the state. And that was why we were supported in eliminating the triggers on the income tax cuts that were passed in 2018. That'll happen in 2023. And I can tell you businesses are already uh, trying to figure out how they will be deploying capital that will be treated differently in that year. Uh, so we're very pleased with that portion of the law. Uh, they, the law also uh, uh, eliminated over time the inheritance tax in Iowa. And Iowa, just by the way, it is a smaller state, has a lot of family businesses, a lot of family farming. Transferring those entities from one generation to another uh, is a moment when uh, you know, the, the, the capital of those uh, entities is constricted as they try to comply with tax law. Now that that is gone, we think that we're going to have a smooth transition of of family-held businesses, family-held farms uh, will have a very good effect on the economy in Iowa. Uh, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, another another uh, issue that was tackled by the uh, by the tax law uh, was how to change Iowa from being the only state in the country that relied on 99 counties to raise revenue to fund mental health services in the state of Iowa. Uh, care was very uneven throughout the state. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, trying to figure out how to have kind of a state oversight without having state funding be responsible for the outcomes. Difficult, impossible. That's why 40 and other, and other states didn't do it that way. Uh, Iowa moved away from that this year. Uh, they did that uh, uh, in part by eliminating a backfill of revenues that had been sent to local governments uh, ever since a property tax measure was passed many years ago. Uh, they did try to respect that some counties had been growing more quickly than others uh, to make up for that lost revenue. Uh, so if you're in a slow growth county, uh, the phase out period is longer. Uh, if you're in a fast growth economy that's already seen the recovery of those uh, property tax dollars, uh, your phase out was uh, uh, more rapid. 
but we think uh, that's going to have better outcomes for mental health. Uh, it'll have smooth out the fiscal differences between counties, uh, as some were provider counties and some were uh, counties that sent individuals to other counties for care. We just think this is a better way of, of administering that program. So we are pleased overall uh, with the tax bill uh, as it passed this year. Thank you, JD. And uh, one thing that JD and I have continued to reinforce throughout this presentation is that our process is really grassroots at ABI. And um, uh, this bill right here, Senate File 361, that you see on your screen, this is a, uh, a, an outcome of that of a grassroots process. ABI's Workplace and Product Safety Committee uh, formed a subcommittee last fall following our, our August meeting to talk about ways that Iowa's uh, drug and alcohol testing statute could be improved for employers so that some balance could be brought back into that part of the code. And uh, uh, we had a, a bill put together, uh, a very solid bill that came out of the Senate and is, is currently in the House Labor Committee. And uh, a couple key pieces of this bill, including uh, creating a standard of causation when a plaintiff is bringing a claim against an employer. Uh, right now, there currently isn't a standard for causation, which is a, a, a legal term or a legal burden that uh, somebody has to prove in their case against uh, the defendant. And so you can see that in the second bullet point right there. Uh, we think that's a very important piece and that it will help eliminate gotcha cases when employers might commit technical violations of the statute, but those uh, violations are in no way related to the claim that's being brought against them. That third bullet point talks about shifting the burden of proof from the employer to the plaintiff when proving that the employer violated the statute we think this is really just a common sense change. Uh, you should be innocent until you're proven guilty. That's the way the system works here in America. So we think that's a positive uh, change that can get done next year. And then uh, that fourth bullet point, uh, there have been some negative outcomes in court for employers concerning this definition of safety sensitive positions. Uh, we think tightening that up uh, because it's vague right now will help employers be able to uh, designate those jobs as those kinds of positions. And then that fifth bullet point, uh, modernizing communication methods between the employer and the employee when talking about drug and alcohol testing results. We're seeking to streamline that process by allowing for in-person communication and communicating those results by email, uh, really uh, uh, kind of modernizing that part of the code. So we got a good bill. We got it out of the Senate. It's currently in the House Labor Committee, and we'll be working to ensure that gets passed the House next year and down to uh, Governor Reynolds for her consideration uh, and so we're pleased about the progress there. Workplace safety, uh, House File 283. This is really an interesting issue because of the subject matter, uh, and it might seem kind of trivial to, to some folks who might be on the call today, but it's really an important one because we've had manufacturing members come to us over the last few years and talking about how they're seeing an increased rise in the use of synthetic urine to try to defraud a drug or alcohol test. And uh, before this bill became law on July 1st, there was no penalty for that kind of behavior. So really the intent of the bill is to deter individuals from uh, committing this kind of behavior uh, when passing a test. We know that employers and ABI members really pride themselves on making sure that they send their employees home safe each and every night to their families. And we certainly wouldn't want somebody um, who cheats on a test to get out there on the manufacturing floor, injure themselves or injure somebody else. And so. That's the intent of the, the legislation and there was significant bipartisan support in the House. And again, that's been signed by the governor. Another big issue that uh, ABI has been working on and it had more than any other issue, this one has been heightened by, by the pandemic. Uh, just for background, uh, all, on, all employers uh, uh, pay into an unemployment uh, insurance uh, uh, fund uh, and all those that find themselves unemployed by no fault of their own uh, have access to that fund to make sure they can bridge themselves between the job they've just lost to the, to the next job that they're going to find. Uh, in a typical year, uh, in round numbers, employers in Iowa put about $400 million into the unemployment trust fund. And by the same account, uh, workers that find themselves unemployed uh, also take about $400 million uh, out of that fund. Uh, 2020 and 2021 were no different for Iowa employers, about $400 million going into that fund. But the magnitude of the pandemic has really felt nowhere more than it is in the Employment Trust Fund. 
the unemployment trust fund had four billion billion with a B dollars uh, move through that fund, a combination of state and federal dollars. Uh, incredible administration feat uh, taken on with really no advance warning, uh, but uh, they really heightened the, the, the importance of that fund and the importance of making sure we understand how it's working uh, and, and how we can deliver benefits to unemployed workers at this while also making sure that we're not overburdening the employers that are responsible for maintaining the solvency of that fund. And one of the actions that was taken uh, by the governor in 2020 uh, led Iowa uh, in the nation. Uh, this was not duplicated in this way anywhere else in the country. But uh, Governor Reynolds took 40% of that first wave of federal help that we got uh, in the, from the CARES Act and put $490 million uh, into the Unemployment Trust Fund to offset would have, what would have been a uh, half a billion dollar tax increase on employers to maintain the solvency of that fund. Uh, we're not done yet. Uh, the, uh, the claims continued at uh, a very high increased pace. We expect uh, uh, through uh, understandings we have that uh, this trust fund uh, to avoid a uh, a tax increase in 2022 will require another similar action by the governor, uh, and, and we expect that. Uh, and so that is good news in Iowa. Uh, your neighbors in Illinois, they have no such protections. Uh, they will be facing unemployment tax increases uh, uh, because of the condition of their fund. Uh, and, and we think it's really important that as employers are trying to rehire uh, that they do not feel the effects of an increased head tax on those people that they would hire. So we will advocate for that position. We brought legislation this past year uh, that uh, we are still working on uh, that will make changes to make sure that Iowa is not an outlier in some of the ways that it, de it delivers its program. Uh, we have seen Iowa was not immune to the fraud that came as part of this large amount of money sitting out there. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, we don't want to blame the unemployed Iowans. That's really not where this fraud came from. This was organized outside the state of Iowa assaults on the program that ran in the tens and tens of millions of dollars. We've got to figure out a way that we can make sure that we have certainty in who we're serving uh, uh, with the unemployment funds before they go out the door. Uh, because one of the things that we've, we've noticed is that the only way if you've if you've overpaid or selected somebody for payment uh, that uh, w does not rightly have a claim uh, to that, uh, there's still a lot of work. Uh, but then now you also have the state uh, of Iowa on the line uh, asking them for the money back. At the same time, they're trying to make mortgage without an income. We've got to get that fixed so that we're not harming people by our, our attempted generosity. So those are things that we'll continue to work on. We have uh, bills that have gone through labor committees on both sides. Uh, we have uh, uh, groups that are getting together in the interim to try to continue on you know, kind of focusing our efforts uh, to make sure we get something done in 2022. And the other bills of interest, these are things that, uh, uh, you know, that Brad and I have been working on uh, that have come up. Um, we had, uh, Iowa was one of the states that uh, determined it was uh, going to prevent the issuing by local governments and the state government of, uh, of, of, of COVID passports. Uh, they did not want to have uh, uh, businesses that were open venues uh, to uh, have to require proof of vaccination for entry. Um, and that bill did pass, but with some important uh, qualifications. Uh, ABI was very interested to make sure that that did not uh, interfere with the employer's right to understand the, uh, the vaccination status uh, of, of their employees so that they could plan for safety. If you're on a tight uh, manufacturing line, uh, you need to know uh, how you need to be managing uh, individuals depending on whether or not they were uh, vaccinated or not, whether or not that means you need to uh, uh, you know, move forward with mask mandates because you have a high number of, un uh, of unvaccinated. So we made sure that uh, businesses in their employer-employee relationship uh, kept all the latitude that they had currently. 
Um, and then another bill uh, uh, that was passed was a, a bill against mass mandates for schools and local governments to impose. Again, we made sure that the employers uh, had the latitude to say if that makes the most sense for their workforce, they have the ability to do that. House file 724, that uh, third main bullet, th this is um, an adoption mandate regarding policies and benefits for employees who decide to adopt in the first year. Um, this is a perennial issue that's been around for a number of sessions and something that we've worked on for quite some time. Um, we're concerned about it um, because of, you know, obviously it's a mandate and we believe that the marketplace and employers are in the best position to determine what kind of wages and benefits they can provide for their employees. And as we worked on this bill, uh, we're very sensitive to the fact that uh, the proponents of this view it as a pro-life issue. And here at ABI, we do try to stay out of social issues when possible. But when that does cross over into uh, the, the workplace, we do have to get involved and make our voice and opinion known. Um, the bill did come out of the Senate, it, or excuse me, it came out of the House, but didn't come out of the Senate. And we're going to continue to work with uh, lawmakers to uh, inform them and educate them on the potential ramifications that this could have for smaller businesses in particular. Uh, then Senate File 619, this is that big omnibus bill that JD talked about, which was re largely related to tax and housing and child care. Another piece of that bill was uh, imposing payment parity for mental health telehealth services. And uh, again, one thing the pandemic really put a spotlight on was how important telehealth has become and uh, being able to uh, examine those who need that help. And um, really, when we couldn't be gathered together, uh, it became a vital resource for many folks. And uh, we're going to be tracking the effects of this uh, from the employer perspective to make sure that uh, costs aren't increasing on employers through uh, a greater uh, insure, uh, health insurance cost. And then, you know, how does that affect employees as those costs are passed along to them? So we'll be following it, talking to some of our members in that uh, space to see what kind of effect that might be having. Uh, there were some uh, pieces of legislation that were introduced that did not pass that had an effect on uh, business that had us getting busy to express our association's perspective uh, on, on what was what was happening. Uh, we did have a piece of legislation that came up, uh, Senate File 555, that would have prohibited uh, an employer when hiring from asking a uh, prospective employee whether or not they'd been vaccinated. And it would also prevent an employer from asking uh, existing employees their vaccination status. Um, you know, we, we just thought that very problematic on the way that you have to plan for safety within a, within a, a, a business space. Uh, it also kind of violates the kind of it exactly violates the the at will uh, relationship between employers and employees uh, that an employer owns the workplace. Uh, the, the specific examples, uh, I mean, here we've been reading this week, you know, about uh, difficulties uh, between the United States and Canada determining how to open up their border. Uh, Canada saying, OK, it's time to go and the United States saying no. Well, in Iowa, you can imagine we have a lot of supply chain manufacturers into the implement and automobile uh, space. Uh, there are a lot of the same type of manufacturers in Canada and into Michigan and where we supply a lot into there. Um, if you can't send an employee to Canada because you have no idea of their vaccination status and you learn that when they get turned around at the airport, you're not being able to do your business very well. It just It's just practicality requires that we have to understand the status of our employees. Uh, so that bill, while it had a lot of head of steam upon introduction, uh, it, uh, it did not pass. Uh, there are still great interest in the legislature for doing something like this um, among some senators, particularly. Uh, and so we will continue to watch that uh, uh, because the bill uh, can be resurrected at any time. Another bill uh, that uh, we've dealt with in multiple years is that E-Verify legislation uh, that seeks to have employers uh, use a very specific program to determine the immigration status of potential employees. Uh, on its face, uh, that doesn't sound like such a bad idea to figure out how to how to how to uh, you know manage that issue. Uh, but the 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 method and and the penalties for not complying were things that ABI just had to object to. Uh, the first, it was uh, the use of an e-verified database maintained at the federal government, which just spot auditing will tell you 
Uh, it is a, not a very accurate database. It, if, if you're relying upon that, you can get yourself in trouble. Uh, the, the second the second thing was that the the enforcement of of this law and the penalties for lack of compliance were we thought just very out of line. Uh, we have members that will have you know that'll be in the retail space that will have over a hundred. Uh, retail facilities in the state of Iowa. Think of convenience stores. Um, they have managers all in 100 spots that are all in charge of hiring. And if and if a manager in Northeast Iowa and a manager in Southwest Iowa both made a mistake under this law, all 100 facilities in the state of Iowa could lose their license to operate. Uh, that just seems to be outsized enforcement. Uh, we tried to take those concerns to proponents they were not interested in, in negotiating on what is the appropriate level of enforcement. And because of that, we just had to say we could not come along and that bill did not move. Another bill that uh, has been around for a few years now is Senate File 485. And like JD talked about with the E-Verify legislation, this seems, as you can see the description right there, it seems very innocent on its face and that there wouldn't be any kind of concern with it. but it would have potential uh, legal ramifications for employers who would be found to be violating this. Um, the key thing when uh, lawmakers are making law is the definition of certain terms. So how do you define reasonable accommodations? How do you define when it says in the bill, a reasonable accommodation shall not impose an undue hardship? Well, what does that mean? Um, a lot of these things are really subject to interpretation by the, the individual. And so what the bill would have done had an employer violated it was allow uh, somebody to bring somebody before the Civil Rights Commission here in Iowa. And uh, it, it just was not workable for employers. And um, we did narrow the scope of that bill. It did come out of the Senate Labor Committee, but didn't come to the floor. And so after some education and talking to folks about, hey, this is uh, we do have issues with this and here's why we were su successful in stopping that. That fourth bullet point, House File 121, Again, a COVID-19 related issue. Uh, the ultimate uh, result of this would be if there was a rebuttable presumption for employees who could show that they were exposed or contracted uh, COVID-19 in the workplace, that workers' compensation would be have uh, would have to be paid to them. Well, the biggest issue is how do you prove in a court of law that you've contracted COVID-19 in the workplace? Um, I think because the the, the virus is uh, obviously very viral, uh, nobody is really uh, able to determine where they're contracting it. So issues with that and uh, that did not come out of the Labor Committee in the House. Then the last bill, which is uh, uh, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, again, ABI is in a position that we believe the marketplace and employers are in the best position to determine what kind of wages, again, and benefits that they can provide for their uh, employees. And I think you're seeing it happen naturally without a, a mandate from the federal or state government. Wages are rising right now because uh, workers are in high demand and so employers are competing with one another and offering uh, higher wages and better benefits. So uh, it's really working naturally. And um, again, that bill didn't move out of the Labor Committee this year. As you guys transition to the numbers, as you can tell, we've had a lot of issues that we've talked about this year and a lot happened at the legislative session that you don't always read about in the paper. I know we're coming up on about 10 minutes left. Um, just wanted to see, Andy, I know there's been some questions in the chat. Um, and I know that you just put some additional comments too regarding uh, welders and some of the challenges with, with students uh, participating in the workforce. Any other questions? And then I know Representative Wolf also had a question about unemployment. Um, any other questions from uh, those who are participating right now before we wrap up? I was gonna have Andy Sokolovich talk about that. He's pretty on top of that, I think we've got JT Cullen doing it, but we're, we are really struggling with other companies jumping on board with the welding apprenticeship program. Yeah, and it's really just, uh, how do I phrase this? It's really just an apprehension from the companies to participate, more so because their legal team or their insurance provider feels that the liability is too risky. Um, you know, I just pasted here in the chat, according to child labor provisions for non-agricultural occupations under the Fair Labor Standards Act, Child Labor Bulletin 101, uh, they can perform duties associated with that apprenticeship under the age of 18, as long as they're not, they're not doing a few things, and that's operating an overhead hoist or driving a forklift. Um, so there is coverage for those companies.
companies uh, through the child labor provisions in the Department of Labor. It's just the company's a little bit more conservative and less progressive than we would want them to be. So as we introduce apprenticeships into the workforce and we have employers who are uh, scared or concerned about the liability, we have a hard time creating these apprenticeships and then taking the students to the employers that we don't have the employers that are willing to support it. In a nutshell. Yeah. Thanks for that, Andy. I know that's something that um, we have heard. I served on the computer science task force and we heard that a lot with apprentices. You know, the employers say we we need workers and we want people to participate, but then the school is saying, well, we're, we've got 15 people for you. And it seems that sometimes, especially um, like you said, for some employers, it's hard for them to change their policies or to get it geared up. I think those companies that have seen once they take the time and the resources initially, then it's well worth it. Um, and so that's something for us to keep in mind is as, as we're also having conversations with workforce development and they're trying to encourage more companies to get in, involved in this too. Thank you both for your expertise on that and feedback and willingness to partner with the uh, employers. And then I, I would like to, I, we don't have enough time today. I, I would really like to talk about a little more about these regional planning partnerships and how they work and uh, how they it can uh, fuel workforce development with regional centers and getting more of a financial commitment by the state in these areas that would really support the initiatives of ABI. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I'm, I'm making a note now that we are, you know, just a week or two away from the beginning of our in our public policy meetings, I'm going to make sure that in our workforce committee, we're talking about the regionalization of that. Uh, it is not something that we talked about a year ago, so that's new to us to to be considering. Uh, and so we will uh, we'll, we'll put a regionalism uh, overlay on all of what we're talking about on on you know not just talking about funding of these programs, but how we're delivering. So appreciate that. I I, I wanted to answer one question that I saw that. Uh, Representative Wolf had to talking about the unemployment issue and the fact that uh, you know the unemployment uh, uh, benefits provided by the federal government that were suspended by the governor uh, that were to flow through until September. Uh, she'd asked if you know what was happening on the employer side and uh, be whether or not employers now were being uh, charged for the experience of their employees on the unemployment scale. And yes, we are. Uh, that all happened at the same time. So when the federal government dollars were suspended, uh, they, uh, the, the companies in the state of Iowa then uh, began having the experience of their uh, unemployed uh, employees, if you will, uh, as part of what will help set their individual rates for uh, unemployment taxes in 2022. Uh, for everybody, that was suspended during the pandemic because uh, it was felt that the conditions that led to unemployment within a specific company weren't specific to that company anymore. It was federal and state policy that was driving people to become unemployed. Uh, and uh, that period is uh, is over for employers. We'll now be uh, making sure we keep track of who becomes unemployed in our uh, facilities, and that will be part of how our rates are set. Did anybody else have comments for us uh, that we should be taking back to our, our policy committees or or anything you wanted us to uh, uh, to kind of respond to individually now? Nicole, did you see anything else in the chat that we ought to be uh, addressing? I did not. Okay. Um, yes? Well, I'll just go ahead and just wrap okay. it up here real quick. You can see our by the numbers um slide here we, we have 1500 member companies and uh, a lot of issues that we track like we've talked about today the most important number here on this screen in my opinion is the number 11 because that's the number of bills that passed the legislation and were sent to the governor and all in all it was a really uh, good year for business and industry so we were very happy with the results of the session yeah well thank you brad and i just foreshadowing the last few minutes, you're going to see the legislature back this fall uh, and, and they can consider anything they want once they're brought back into session. The session will be called for the purposes of meeting the constitutional and statutory requirements to redistrict all, all 100 House seats, all 50 Senate seats at the state level and our congressional seats 
uh, all four. Uh, and uh, right now they're waiting for data to come from the federal government. Uh, they'll get that in mid-August. Uh, they'll, they'll allow a nonpartisan agency uh, to massage those numbers to come up with what is unique to Iowa, uh, 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 a, a, a nonpartisan solution to providing compact districts that respect, you know, county and city lines as much as possible. Legislature will come into a special session to vote on that. They can vote that map up or down that has been provided to them. Uh, if they vote it down, it goes back to the same agency for development. Uh, and they'll come back and on round two, they'll vote again up or down uh, whether or not they like the, 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 the way that the maps were put together. Uh, it has never happened in the state of Iowa, uh, but if they to reject a second map, uh, you would then get a third map developed by the same agency, but the legislature then would be free to amend that however the uh, legislature wished, and then they would uh, take a vote on that. Uh, it's worth noting that this system was put in place after the Supreme Court of Iowa stepped in and drew lines back in the 70s that both Republicans and Democrats didn't much care for. <laughs> and so they came up with this nonpartisan system of putting it together. Uh, we're up against some of those constitutional deadlines again because from, you know, no, no blame assessed, but the federal government didn't get their homework done in time, uh, pandemic and other reasons. Uh, so we're up against some of those constitutional uh, deadlines again. I think uh, the legislature is in a place where they don't want to see the Supreme Court take over that process for the very same reasons they put this process in the place uh, that we've been using since this census in 1980. Uh, so from your standpoint, though, be watching the legislative session because once they're gathered, uh, any any issue uh, that uh, they want to bring up in addition to redistricting uh, is a fair fight uh, as far as they're concerned. Uh, groups like ours make sure we have our defenses up and uh, we're ready to assist if something uh, appropriate is going through as well. So uh, watch your papers. The, no one has set a time for this, but we expect it probably to be in the October time frame. So we get a little bonus session here this year. Again, I think uh, we want to thank you and I'll go ahead there on the contacts, Brad. Well, this is just how you can stay connected with us. Uh, JD, Nicole and I are tweeting regularly once uh, this legislature is in session. So be sure to watch us on social media and then we're also on uh, Facebook as well. And um, I just want to thank everybody for uh, attending today. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the Clinton Regional Development Corporation for hosting us. And Andy, thank you very much for reaching out to us about this opportunity. And uh, if anybody has questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Yeah, th thank you for your input. And we will take all that we learned today uh, to our, our issue committees to make sure that uh, your input's considered. Uh, appreciate it. It's very valuable. Absolutely. ABI is a great organization. I encourage all of you employers that are listening today to consider uh, joining the group. They do phenomenal things and they are our voice at the Hill. So, Brad, thank you so much. JD, Nicole, you guys have been great. I appreciate this legislative update. Stay in touch and I look forward to the next session. Thank you. Great, Thanks, thank you. All right, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye.